Okie dokie, we've run into some new problems at Disney World, but fear not, because for every problem we've come across, we've also found a solution. Mostly. You're gonna see what I mean. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. Now, I hate to bring new Disney World problems to your attention right before your upcoming Disney World trip, but think of it this way. If you learn them now, then you learn how to navigate them before your vacation. Warning though, some of these problems are kind of shocking. Some of them we never expected to happen to us, and some of them actually flat out hurt our feelings. I'm being dead serious still recovering. But whatever the case might be for you, we're here to make sure these problems are handled with grace by the time your Disney World getaway rolls around. Okay, first up, let's talk about ride problems that get worse as you get older. Hi, it's me, I'm the problem. As much as I don't wanna recognize that some Disney World problems weren't problems for me in the past because I was younger then, it's time to finally address that elephant in the room. Some of the coasters hurt nowadays, y'all. And sorry, I gotta point fingers. The main offender lately is Space Mountain in Magic Kingdom. That ride has gotten really rough, and I'm not just talking about the track itself, though that does leave me needing to see a chiropractor sometimes. I'm also talking about just simply getting in and out of the ride. Boarding those low to the ground ride vehicles is a killer and getting out can be just as bad. I mean, seriously, how awkward is it to get out of the Space Mountain coaster vehicles? I'm always like, am I gonna be the one that gets stuck in here and I can't get out? Anyway. This is probably not a problem for you, but for the others of us, it can be. Also, if you're wearing a skirt or a sundress, please wear those shorts underneath. Just wear them. Now, the ride vehicles are also super cramped, which wasn't as much of an issue when I was real small, but now that I'm at least a little taller than I was when I was like 10, I have to fold up like an accordion every time I want to ride. But space isn't the only coaster that's been giving me a rough go lately. Even new coasters like Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind get increasingly more difficult to ride as my motion sickness gets worse, as I age? See, I told you the problems in this video were gonna wind up hurting my feelings. And since we don't have a machine like Dr. Seeker and Dinosaur where we can go back in time to our younger years and experience Disney's classic and new attractions when we were at our prime, we gotta take matters into our own hands to make sure we can keep enjoying the rides that were our all-time favorites back then. Now, I can remember I used to be able to ride Expedition Everest like seven times in a row after three margaritas and have no problem. Now, I can get through one ride, no margaritas, and still kind of feel like I'm about to throw up. Anyway, there are a few pieces of advice here for you adults who can relate a little bit too much. One, pack those over-the-counter pain relievers. Luckily, each Disney park has a first aid station for minor emergencies like queasy tummies or coaster headaches, but it's also important to keep your preferred over-the-counter pain meds and motion sickness relief in your park bag. You may also wanna consider packing a muscle relief cooling balm, like something you can roll on your shoulders and neck and back after a coaster ride too many. If your knees have been known to betray you after having to get in and out of coasters back to back or just after walking around the parks for tens of thousands of steps on end, prepare for that ahead of time by packing drugstore aids like knee wraps or knee braces, athletic tapes, that'll make you look really cool like an Olympic athlete. Just make sure you try them out before your visit to make sure they're breathable and comfortable to wear for extended periods of time and that you know how to actually wear them. <laughs> and pace out your ride experiences. Even if you've got Disney Genie Plus on your side, which might give you the opportunity to ride those heavy duty Disney rides one after the other, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should. After a coaster ride that might have taken a little bit more audio than you care to admit, plan on either going to see a show or grab a snack or hit up a calmer ride next. After a trip on Space Mountain, uh, maybe the People Mover is the right choice next. And if I'm feeling nauseous after a ride on Cosmic Rewind, you'll more than likely find me sitting down for a bit over in the World Celebration Gardens or just, you know, go on living with the land. Everybody loves that ride. By the way, it is absolutely okay to let your group know that you need a break. In fact, admitting that you need a break may help others in your group be brave enough to admit that they need it too. Now, also sit towards the front on those coasters because where you sit on a coaster is gonna determine how rough your ride through is gonna be. If you're looking for a smoother coaster ride, then sit toward the front. But if your kids still want one that's gonna be a bit more thrilling, then you gotta sit in the back. The back of the coaster, as long as the coaster is a forward-moving coaster, always gets the 
the brunt of the acceleration after the first half of the ride vehicle goes speeding down the track, causing the ride to feel faster, but also a lot rougher and bumpier. Cast members may be tasked with assigning you to a row, not giving you much choice in the matter, but you can always try asking them if it's at all possible for you to wait for the next vehicle so you can sit closer to the front. While it's not always possible for Sam's to do this, they usually try to accommodate you, but you never know unless you ask. Now, once upon a time, we used to talk about how the beginning of each year, so around January and February, was one of Disney's guaranteed off-seasons, but that doesn't really feel like the case anymore, not within these past few years at least. You know, it used to be that the beginning of December was going to be reliably uncrowded. Not so much anymore, and what we're seeing more and more from your comments and from our own experiences is Disney doesn't really have a whole lot of very reliable off-seasons anymore. Now, we're not seeing the highest crowds ever during these times, not like we see during spring break and holidays, but the crowds just don't dissipate around these times if Year anymore the way they used to. A lot of us have the experience of going to Disney World kind of in the 2007, 2008 sort of financial crisis. And then some of us can remember going during COVID. Both of these times were empty in the parks and I maybe we got a little bit used to that, but we are in an upswing right now. So we're in a time frame when those reliable off seasons just don't really exist anymore. So let me give you a brief recap of what we saw happening with the crowd levels just this past winter. At the beginning of January, we still had those lingering New Year's crowds. Then from January 11th to the 14th, we saw the Run Disney weekend crowds. And on top of those, we also ran into the three-day weekend crowds from Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we saw the beginning of Epcot's Festival of the Arts crowds piling into the park. So there was a triple threat with that one. And by the time February rolled around, we had people coming and celebrating Valentine's Day in Disney World. And a few days later, the crowd level spiked again for the three-day President's Weekend. This was also around the same time Festival of the Arts was wrapping up, so we had crowds for the end of the fest too. And while Disney World every now and again has these seemingly random weeks where crowds will drop unexpectedly, this happened a couple of weeks ago from when I'm recording this, that was still a spring break week. It must have been like a transition week or something, and it was like oddly all the wait times dropped significantly just for that one week, and then they went right back up again the next week. But these feel like they're less predictable than they've been in the past, and there's just not a whole lot of downtime for the crowds. However, I will say these three things on the matter. First, August and September continue to be pretty reliable when it comes to lower crowds because kids are going back to school and, well, the weather is not outside around this time of year. DFB Bria here on our team has been to Disney at the end of August and beginning of September three times in the past five years and has run into hurricane threats each and every time. And that's not to say you're for sure going to run into weather related issues when you visit around August or September, but you're definitely going to want to study up on what to do if you happen to get caught in a hurricane like storm before or during your vacation and see what all the different cancellation policies look like. We've got lots of videos on that, lots of how to survive hurricane season videos that have really, really good info in them for you. So go watch those. But the trade off for very, very low crowds can definitely be unbelievable heat and really rough rain weather. Now, second, there are reasons why we may still see sudden drops in Disney World's crowd levels in the future from 2024 and onwards, which we've covered thoroughly in our Why Disney World Could Be Empty in 2024 video. So make sure to check that one out when you get a chance. And finally, if you're planning on traveling to Disney World and you want to try to hit up the parks when crowds might be potentially lower, try scheduling your vacation during the week instead of on the weekend. Weekends usually garner attention from locals and pass holders and those looking for a quick getaway, meaning the parks can still get pretty packed on Saturday Saturdays and Sundays, and depending on the weekend, potentially Fridays and Mondays too. Tuesdays through Thursdays tend to be that sweet spot when crowds aren't as heavy as usual, but that still doesn't mean crowds will be non-existent. So make sure you're continuing to plan ahead and figure out how the crowd levels might impact your family's itinerary. Now, if you want to tap into Disney's own research on when they expect their parks to be the most crowded, just check out the park ticket price calendar on the Disney World website. Disney raises their ticket prices based on demand, and fortunately, Disney posts all of their ticket prices for the whole whole year, so you can get a good look at all the days that are expected to have lower or higher crowds ahead of your visit. Now, our best advice for working around the crowds, book stuff early. Advanced dining reservations can start being made 60 days before your visit. And if you're trying to get a certain Disney hotel discount applied to your upcoming hotel stay, the earlier you can book your room, the less likely that discount will book up before you get the chance to jump on the deal yourself. 
Now, here's something we don't see every day, but now that we've seen it, we're on high alert for it to happen again. During the thick of Disney World's spring break season this year, specifically speaking on March 26th, we saw every single individual Lightning Lane ride sell out across all four Disney World parks in the morning. In case you're unfamiliar with what ILLs are, these are premium add-ons that allow you to bypass the standby queue one time for each of the park's most popular attractions. They become available each day starting at 7 a.m. for Disney hotel guests and at park opening for other guests. So the five attractions you can purchase individual lightning lanes for currently include Tron Light Cycle Run and Seven Dwarfs Mine Train in Magic Kingdom, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind in Epcot, Avatar Flight of Passage in Animal Kingdom, and Star Wars Rise of the Resistance in Hollywood Studios. Now, the only way to skip the line for these rides is to buy an individual lightning lane, or if you want to do it for free, to get a virtual queue spot for Guardians of the Galaxy or Tron. The other rides listed here do not have virtual queue options. So within minutes of the parks opening on March 26th, all of these individual lightning lanes were snatched up lickety split. We do not see that happen very often. It is very, very rare. Now on the same day, we also saw Genie Plus sell out for Magic Kingdom and Hollywood Studios, meaning you could not buy the multi-day Genie Plus option either. And it just goes to show you how incredibly busy it can get in the parks around these really holiday schools out kind of seasons. So this brings us to the very, very important question. What do you do to avoid the long lines when the individual lightning lanes and Genie Plus all sell out? Once again, using that early theme park entry privilege to get into the parks 30 minutes before the general public can help give you the upper hand here. But even rope dropping, i.e. getting to the parks just as soon as they officially open for everyone, can help give you a head start on the day as well. Now don't forget, early theme park entry just for Disney hotel guests. Now it's also a good idea to stick around the parks till the last couple of hours of the night since crowds tend to start thinning out as the sun sets and as those big nighttime shows end, because a lot of folks think that the parks close right after the big nighttime shows, which sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. If you're there during a very busy season, Magic Kingdom might stay open until midnight. So even though the show's over at 9.30, you can still stay and ride rides until midnight. Oh, and speaking of those shows, if you don't mind skipping out on one of the big fireworks things, you'll find that many ride lines tend to drastically dip during the nighttime spectaculars. Now, I'm also a big, big, big fan of those after hours events now. Nowadays, you all know that, which are separately ticketed events that allow a limited number of guests to hang out in the parks for an extra three hours after they close for everyone else, meaning a lot fewer crowds for you to worry about. You are not elbow to elbow. You're just not surrounded by people all the time. And also the sun isn't beating down on you. So after hours only happen on certain nights in certain parks though. So you're going to want to make sure to check the Disney World website, see if the after hours event you want to attend falls during your trip's specific timeline. And if you're planning on staying at a Disney World Deluxe Resort, you can also get the extended evening hours benefit at certain parks on certain nights. It's kind of like after hours, but you don't have to pay extra for it. If you're already staying at a Disney World Deluxe Hotel, you get this for free. This allows you to stay in the park for an extra two hours after they close to the general public. All that being said, if you're still wanting to try your hardest to purchase a specific individual Lightning Lane or Genie Plus add-on for your predictably busy park day, be sure to purchase either or both options as soon as they go live to increase your chances of securing them during those busy, busy Disney seasons. While individual Lightning Lanes go live as early as 7 a.m. for hotel guests, you can actually purchase Genie Plus at midnight on the day of your visit, and that goes for everyone, Disney Resort guests and non-resort guests alike. Now, I won't get into the nitty gritty of all those lightning lane nuances right now, but if you're wanting a Genie Plus cheat sheet to refer back to before or during your Disney World Park days to make sure you're getting the most bang for your lightning lane buck, then go ahead and scan the QR code you see on the screen or head to disneyfoodblog.com slash Disney Genie Plus, and we're going to send you our free Genie Plus cheat sheet today. So this next one might be a new problem for some of you, but if you're about to dine at a sit-down Disney World restaurant for the first time, or you're planning on going to a brand new Disney World restaurant that you've never been to before, then this problem might be a bigger deal than you originally thought it would be. But me being super high maintenance as in general as a person, this has always been on my radar. 
Many restaurants in Disney World have prime real estate seating. I'm talking about tables with the best views across property, with potentially fireworks views, the coolest tables in the joint, you know, those kinds of things. And for a lot of guests, the main reason to book one of these nice sit down meals is for the views. But here's the problem. You're not always guaranteed the best view at one of these restaurants. I can't tell you the number of times I've booked a table at Ohana at Polynesian Village Resort only to get a table facing the wall instead of a window overlooking Magic Kingdom and it's magical happily ever after spectacular. It's a very Charlie Brownish thing to happen to a person when you reach into the mailbox and you don't get a valentine, when you go trick-or-treating and all you get is rocks, when you book a table at Ohana, you get stuck facing the wall. Womp womp womp. Now, you'll often catch me recommending that y'all ask your restaurant host for a certain table before they seat you, but you'll also hear me covering my rear end and telling you that this isn't always a foolproof method. It just never hurts to check, just in case. So how can you improve, not guarantee, but improve, your chances of getting the table you want at a Disney restaurant? Not the one at San and Helen that's over by the bathrooms, not the one at Blue Bayou in Disneyland that's over there by the kitchen. You know, you you guys know what I'm talking about. Those tables that are just bummers. I think Mama Melrose had a two top literally in the hallway where the bathrooms are the last time I was there. I was like, what? Who wants to sit there? <laughs> Anyway, it was very weird, but you get it. And when you're spending big bucks to go to these restaurants and you can only go to them one time in your whole life, you want to have a good experience. So here's strategy number one. Arrive to your reservation early. Check in for reservations at the Disney World restaurant starts 20 minutes before your reservation time. But if you go slightly earlier, like before your 20 minute arrival time opens up, you can ask the host to make a note on your reservation concerning a table request. Again, this doesn't mean a cast member will be able to pull off this table request for you, but they will try their best to do so. And an earlier table request instead of a last minute one will help better the odds for you. Keep in mind that sometimes a table request might wind up extending your wait time though, since a table might need to be cleared off to fulfill your request. But if you're okay with waiting in order to get that picture perfect table side view, then twiddle your thumbs because the payoff could be worth it. But what I want to really, really like overly exaggerate here is do not make this difficult for the cast member. Please don't be one of those people that's in there demanding a certain table, complaining that you didn't get a certain table. Again, I've said over and over and over again, you're not guaranteed a table. There's lots of people dining there. They have to keep things moving. And the more people that request tables, the fewer are going to be able to get them. So understand that that's kind of what you're signing up for. And so if the cast member can't do that for you just be gracious and say thank you and you still get to eat at this fabulous restaurant so it's going to be fine but just don't make it hard for them they have a hard enough job as it is now, strategy two, make a reservation at the right time. The key to actually seeing fireworks while dining from your fireworks view restaurant is to make your reservation time before the fireworks begin. Super popular restaurants can get behind on reservation times, especially when the fireworks are about to go off because a lot of folks just sit there and they're not gonna leave until they see the show. Now, I am not a huge fan of booking your table like three hours in advance of the fireworks and just sitting there and holding the table. Don't do that. That's not cool. But when looking at reservation times, book your reservation maybe 45 minutes before the fireworks to give yourself a cushion in case the dining room is running behind. That way you can also, if they're not running behind, have your meal and then watch the fireworks during your dessert. And that's very nice. Strategy number three, book a restaurant with a balcony. Don't wanna rely on a window view only for a good experience of the fireworks during your meal? You don't have to. Restaurants like California Grill and the Contemporary Resort and Topolino's Terrace and the Riviera have private balconies that'll give you a sweeping view of Magic Kingdom and or Epcot. So even if your table isn't right next to a window, you can still walk out to their balconies to see the shows. California Grill even gives you the option to eat earlier in the evening and come back at a later time to watch the Magic Kingdom fireworks from the comfort of their private balcony. All you have to do is show the California Grill host, located on the second floor of the hotel, your dinner receipt from earlier on that same day. If everything checks out, they'll let you on up to the 15th floor to enjoy the show. So this is definitely a brand new problem that I ran into just a couple weeks ago. And it's not Disney World specific, but any travel you're going to do, you wanna be looking out for this if you're renting a car. So I got a rental car in California. I was heading up to Walt Disney Imagineering for a media event, which was very, very cool, by the way. If you haven't read those articles, please do, because they are 
Oh my gosh, mind blowing. Anyway, I got a rental car that only had USB-C ports. No USB-B ports, which was a sad day for me since my phone's charger wasn't compatible with those USB-C ports and I didn't have the right cords. Now, driving around a big city with my phone battery dropping down to the red and not being able to use it for like Apple CarPlay and stuff was not the extra dose of anxiety that I needed during my trip. I did not need to handle LA traffic without being able to see where I was going. So that was a surprise. I had not had a rental car before that did not have USB-B ports. And maybe that's not a huge Huge issue for you because you're not planning on using a rental car in the future. But even so, it's important to keep in mind that not every place or hotel room or restaurant that you visit on vacation may have the charging ports that you're prepared for. That's why bringing charging adapters or portable chargers is important. With those gadgets handy, you don't have to wonder if your phone is going to be compatible with the charging ports at your next location. You'll always have the ability to charge your phone anywhere that you wind up. This is also true for cruise ships because some older cruise ships don't have USB-C ports. Ports. And so if you basically only have the option to use a USB-C with one of your current devices, then that's something to prepare for as far as adapters as well. Okay, let's talk some Disney menus. They are always changing, we know that, but that doesn't mean we're not taken off guard when select menu items leave us for good. And we've had a bunch of that happening lately. Like the bottomless mimosas that used to be served during breakfast at Steakhouse 71 in the Contemporary Resort. What happened to those? Okay, so technically bottomless mimosas still exist in the Disney bubble during certain weekend brunches offered around Disney Springs, like STK Orlando, House of Blues, Wolfgang Puck. They're just not a daily offering anymore like they used to be at Steakhouse 71. You'll need to check on the menu use of these breakfast and brunch locations that you're planning on visiting to make sure they're still going to have those bottomless mimosas or whatever you're looking forward to for your visit and to read up on the rules of how those bottomless drinks work because more than likely you'll have a time limit you have to adhere to as well as a minimum amount of food that you're going to need to order before you're eligible to order these seemingly endless boozy brunch beverages. And what about all those side dishes that we lost over at Roundup Rodeo Barbecue in Hollywood Studios? Before you were able to order four sides of your choosing from their menu of eight options. And since this meal served family style, you could always change out a side if you didn't like it the first time around or just wanted to try something different. But nowadays that sides menu has shrunk down to a total of five that are all brought out to your table at the same time. So no more choice, y'all. You just get all that's left. Your side options now are the claw veggie slaw, cow poke corn on the cob, potato barrels, buck and baked beans, and slinky dog mac and cheese. Meaning the mean old potato salad, the married spuds, those loaded potato barrels, and force field fried pickles are currently MIA. And let's not forget about the sheer disappointment we felt when Chicken Guy decided to have their sauce options. They used to have 22 and now they've got 10. That's right, Chicken Guy stripped away 12 of their original sauces, leaving us with that measly 10 to choose from. Granted, we've still been left with some good sauce options like the Chipotle Ranch, the Special Sauce, the Nashville Hot Honey. My Buffalo is still there, thank goodness. But I'll forever be bitter about the other fan favorite sauces disappearing like the Avocado Crema, the Blue Cheese, the Lemon Pepper, and the Teriyaki. Now, last minute entry I had to add to this list. I hate to tell y'all this, but the loaded burnt ends fries from Regal Eagle Smokehouse and Epcot are no more as of this recording. I'm hoping that we're making a big enough stink about it that they might bring them back, but I don't know if they're going to. Anyway, when we asked a Regal Eagle cast member about them, they told us that these loaded fries had been made with leftovers from the brisket, but now that the restaurant has honed in on its craft and knows how much meat needs to be prepared each day, they don't have as many leftovers as before. So now any leftovers are just added to their sides of baked beans instead. Makes sense, but still, this is a tragedy. So for now, I will hold tightly onto my pulled pork and cheese loaded fries from Flame Tree Barbecue in Animal Kingdom and pray those don't disappear again too, like they have before. Now, while these new disappearances are still a fresh wound for the DFB team and me, the concept of Disney menus taking away fan favorite items, not new. I used to write, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, I wrote about when they took the fried Borsan cheese off the menu at 50s Primetime Cafe. I was devastated. Now, luckily they brought it back and it's still on the menu, thank goodness. But oh my goodness, I was gone for years. and It was just a horrible time. And we still feel the pain of losing our favorite eats and drinks around the Disney scene often. 
It's basically an occupational hazard at this point. But when one treat disappears, usually a dozen plus new treats enter onto the Disney scene, and we promise to always keep you updated through our DFB newsletter and our DFB guides to let you know just as soon as any of these major menu shakeups decide to take place. Now, one thing I can say, even though we've lost all of this stuff, we have gotten that absolutely stunning millionaire shortbread over there at the basket at Wine Bar George. That thing is phenomenal. I know I've talked to you about it before. I know I've let you know that all of my British, Irish, Australian viewers are probably have millionaire shortbread just like at their house all the time. But those of us here in America, we do not. And so I definitely want you to go try that if you haven't already had millionaire shortbread 12,000 times in your life. Okay, so to be fair, this isn't exactly a new early theme park entry issue, but it's one that slips our mind way too often. So often, in fact, that we've accidentally found ourselves forgetting about it from time to time and throwing us off the course of our Disney days. So before I get into that, let me give you a brief, very brief description of what early theme park entry is. This is a bonus perk for guests staying at a Disney owned hotel or another qualifying good neighbor hotel. I've mentioned it briefly in this video already, which lets you enter any of the four Disney World theme parks on any day, a half hour before all the other guests. This is a great way to get in line for your most anticipated Disney rides before the regular crowd shuffles in. Oh, I love a Billy Joel reference. Anyway, while most rides will be open and available during early theme park entry, not every ride will be. I repeat, not every single ride in the park is open during early theme park entry. Some notable rides that are missing from early entry rise and shine lineups include Kilimanjaro Safaris, what? I know. Kali River Rapids, and eh, nobody wants to ride that in the morning anyway. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, how? Jungle Cruise, how again? Pirates of the Caribbean, how a third time? And Haunted Mansion in the Magic Kingdom. I, what, why are you even going? Anyway. Grand Fiesta Tour, Living with the Land, Journey into Imagination with Figment, and Epcot also do not open during early entry. Also note that rides that don't currently have a standby line, like Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind and Tron Light Cycle Run, are not open for early entry either. You must still use a virtual queue or buy an individual lightning lane to get on those rides. And character meet and greets won't be available either because Mickey and friends want to be all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed before they meet you, and they're not getting up that early. So before you build your itinerary around one of these attractions, make sure to keep in mind that they'll only open once the park's officially open for everybody. So use that early theme park entry time to get in line for other popular rides that will be open, including, but not limited to, Peter Pan's Flight in Magic Kingdom, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure in Epcot, Flight of Passage in Animal Kingdom, and Rise of the Resistance in Hollywood Studios. Now, how about those rides that are betraying us? That just goes to show you, you can't trust anyone, not even your favorite Disney World rides. Sometimes it doesn't matter how many tricks or tips or Genie Plus rules you've studied up on. There's nothing you can do if a ride goes down for whatever reason. And that feeling of powerlessness is not a great feeling, not at all. While ride breakdowns aren't a new problem in the Disney scene, that's what they call the 101, the amount of ride breakdowns for some rides is becoming more of a problem with each passing year. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad in Magic Kingdom, for instance, seems to go down daily nowadays, which is a real shame since it's one of the sole attractions keeping Frontierland afloat right now, while Country Bear Musical Jamboree and Tiana's Bayou Adventure are still being finished up. And another Magic Kingdom ride that goes down all the time? Would it surprise you if I said Pirates of the Caribbean? Yep, this one seems to have downtime on the daily as well. Fortunately, both of these rides will usually go back online later on in the day after a couple of tweaks and adjustments, so just keep checking on the My Disney Experience app so you know when they're back on track again. Also Space Mountain, we've been seeing Space Mountain down quite a bit too. Now, speaking of being back on track or lack of track, we also tend to see those trackless dark rides go down a lot too, like Rise of the Resistance and Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway in Hollywood Studios and Remy's Ratatouille Adventure in Epcot. A big reason for that is because the trackless technology is super sensitive. Trackless dark rides are controlled by an array of sensors that maneuver the different vehicles around each of the show buildings in a seemingly random manner. This is awesome, but because of this, the rides are extremely touchy, so if something falls out of your ride vehicle, no matter how big or small, or if 
if a guest reaches out their hand just a little too far, the ride system's gonna shut down for safety reasons. Which is why it's so important to keep your hands inside these rides at all times and make sure all your loose items are safe and secure. Now, even though these rides tend to be on the struggle bus more than others lately, that doesn't mean they're the only Disney World rides that give us trouble. All Disney World rides can have their moments of 101. And sometimes these rides will go down even when you're standing in line for them, which is just the pits, believe me. Now, this begs the question, when should you get out of a line for a ride breakdown versus when should you tough it out and hope for the best? We've all had to make this decision, right? First and foremost, pay attention to what the cast member or pre-recorded message is actually saying to you over the ride announcements. If you can hear that announcement, that is. Sometimes those announcements can be hard to make out over the intercom system, especially if everyone's chattering in line. So you might just have to wave down the nearest CM and ask them what's up. Now, if you hear a cast member or pre-recorded message saying that the ride is temporarily stopped, it's a pretty safe bet that whatever's going on will be a quick fix, usually. If you used a lightning lane to scan into the ride that just shut down, cast members will typically offer ride ride redemption passes that can be used at other attractions. So even if the delay is going to be longer than you would have hoped, stick around at least long enough to receive these redemption passes from a cast member. If the severity of the breakdown is a little more than just a short delay, what we tend to do is wait things out for about 15 minutes before cutting our losses. Any longer than that, and it starts to feel like we're gambling away the rest of our park day. That can be a real bummer if you've already waited in line for forever, and I wish I had more of a solution for you that fix things to be good as new. But the truth is, I've been caught in these situations a lot of times too, and they stink. But that doesn't mean these breakdowns have to ruin your whole day. Again, the My Disney Experience app's gonna let you know when a ride is back up and running, if they ever go back online during the day. But in the meantime, you can take this opportunity to experience a different attraction that's still available, or maybe you can use this time to treat yourself to a little snack, pick me up. The important lesson here is to allow that flexibility in your day. Don't get frozen in frustration. Don't have analysis paralysis because of one ride breakdown to the point where you're fixated on it working again. Instead, keep the park day momentum going, fill your day with as much as you can, and hopefully that'll fill the void of that broken attraction and you can leave it behind. All right, so at Disney World, you want new, you want unique, you want something you can't get anywhere else. So when you buy a Disney World snack on property thinking it's gonna be something you're only gonna find inside the Disney bubble, you might be shocked to find an identical or even near identical treat when you go back home. Recently, we learned that True Moo is gonna be releasing a blue milk to a grocery store near you that's directly inspired by the drinks over at Galaxy's Edge and Hollywood Studios. Now, the previewed packaging we've seen for this blue milk so far has mentioned it'll be blue colored vanilla low fat milk with other flavors, which makes us think it might be at least a little different from the park specific blue milk we've already tried since the blue milk in the parks is dairy free, so it's not really milk. However, if you're just looking for the blue milk novelty to check it off your Star Wars bucket list, you might soon be able to skip the blue milk expense at the parks. Those things are like eight bucks and head straight to your local dairy aisle instead. Now, when Bria was at Fresh Market the other day, she found a four count box of Bao cheese cheeseburger from the Wow Bao brand. So of course she picked it up to see if it was anything like the cheeseburger pods you can get from Satuli Canteen in Animal Kingdom that we talk about ad nauseum. Sure enough, the flavor was similar enough that it scratched the cheeseburger pod itch for her so she didn't have to keep craving it all the way back in South Carolina. Now she's still waiting for her fellow reporters to back her up on this discovery, but she thinks if she paired these microwave bows with some chips and slaw, it hit the nail on the head. Now at your local big box grocery stores, you're apt to find Mickey Premium Bar or a Mickey ice cream sandwiches in one of the freezer aisles. While these aren't flat out twins of the park premium bars, they're smaller, they're close enough. And instead of having to pay near seven bucks for just one bar or sandwich in the parks, which is insane by the way, I remember when they were $3.50. Anyway, you can pay for a six count at your grocery store for eight bucks. And you know those all famous Dole Whips that we rave about all the time? Well, the ones in Disney World go hard and also tend to come in different varieties. We love them. Dole Whip Frozen Treats recently released in grocery stores too, now coming in flavors like strawberry mango and that classic pineapple. Four cups of Dole Whip in these grocery store packages typically cost a little over nine bucks, but a single serving of the classic pineapple Dole Whip in the parks is five bucks. Now, AJ, you might be asking, are there any actually unique snacks to the Disney World parks? Oh, loads. You've got items like the Wookiee Cookie at Backlot Express, the Tropical Serenade in Magic Kingdom, the Night Blossom in Animal Kingdom, so many food booth treats across Epcot's festivals. I could keep going, but if you really want a detailed list of the hundreds upon hundreds of different Disney World snacks across each of the parks, check out our DFB snack guides. They're over on dfbstore.com, and we literally have every single snack in the 
parks in those guides with a full color picture, a full review, whether they're on the Disney dining plan or not, all the info you need to just like swipe through every snack in the parks and figure out if that's something you want to spend your money on. Head to dfbstore.com, check them out, and you can use code YouTube to get a discount on that purchase if you want to get those. Okay, for years we've had a pretty good idea of how the Epcot festivals were going to go down. You got your food booths, your live concerts, your extra activities, your scavenger hunts, your snack crawls. But now that Communicore Hall and Plaza are entering the scene, we got to go back to the drawing board. Communicore Hall and Plaza will be a dedicated festival area in the heart of Epcot inside the World Celebration Area, launching officially on June 10th, 2024. Communicore Plaza is going to provide that outdoor space where guests can watch large scale concerts or intimate performances, including those festival concert series that are held throughout the year, which currently include the Disney on Broadway concert series for Festival of the Arts, the Garden Rocks concert series for Flower and Garden, Eat to the Beat for Food and Wine, and the Candlelight Processional for Festival of the Holidays. Inside Communicore Plaza will be Communicore Hall, a fully fleshed out festival building with the ability to host a wide variety of experiences featuring featuring food, art, live music, a demo kitchen, a mixology bar, and an exhibition and gallery space. So you guys remember back when the food and wine festivals used to have a festival center, right? For a while, it was in the Wonders of Life Pavilion. Then they moved it over into the World Showplace Pavilion. Well, that's kind of what they're building here. Communicore Hall will become that as a purpose-built location for the festivals that happen throughout the year. But the bottom line of this particular problem is that for the first time in a long time, we don't really know what to expect. We don't know if Disney's going to bring back the seminars and demonstrations for the Food and Wine Festival, if we're going to see celebrity chefs come back in and do presentations. You know, what kind of shows are we going to see? Are they going to do anything at America Gardens Theater or not? So it's all just up in the air. And we certainly don't even know when this festival is going to open at the moment as I'm recording this. I'm hoping they give us that information soon, but right now I don't have it. But we do know a few things. Recently, Disney announced that a live show is going to begin on June 10th, right when the hall opens up, called Celebracion Encanto. Now, it's an Encanto-inspired production. It'll be a sing-along featuring popular songs and characters from the film. Communicore Hall is also going to be the new home for Mickey and Friends meet and greet. There's even a big giant sign that says Mickey and Friends. Now, who are these friends that'll be joining Mickey? We don't know, but the former character spot that used to be in Epcot featured Minnie and Goofy, too, so we wouldn't be surprised if they popped up here. We are pretty jazzed to see this new area finally open up once and for all, just to see how it shakes up our festival experiences. But we still got a lot of questions, especially when it comes to our food booth tasting strategies and what potential demonstrations and exhibitions we might want to factor into our festival visits and budget into them too, because those can be expensive. Even though the Communicore area hasn't opened up just yet, we're still being impacted right now by some major festival changes directly associated with Communicore's anticipated opening. Date. These past few years, Flower and Garden has been a long running festival lasting up until the 4th of July. But this year, the festival is getting cut short ish and will only be around until May 27th. Much like I mentioned earlier, when it comes to Disney and their big bad menu changes, it's never a good idea to get too comfortable with your Disney itinerary because there's always the chance they're going to announce something that'll make you change your plans entirely. So make sure that when you're planning your Disney days, you leave room for flexibility. And if one anticipated event doesn't work out for you, make sure you got a plan B raring to go instead. For example, if you're planning to go to Epcot at the beginning of June, you'll have to count your flower and garden losses, sure, but you may also be visiting the park during its calm before the Communicore storm, meaning crowds might, keyword might, be easier to manage around this time. Lots of unknown factors are still looming over our heads, but we'll make sure to let you know when we do about the latest announcements. Don't forget to sign up for that newsletter. It's all going to be in there and it's totally free. Now, I asked the DFB reporters what their biggest park problem has been since 2024 started up, and the answer was almost unanimous. Passholder good to go days. A little background for you. On January 9th this year, Disney removed the park pass reservation requirements for most guests, meaning most folks don't need to plan ahead and reserve their spot in any of the theme parks before their trip. But when I say most, this does not include guests with non date based tickets like annual pass holders or cast members, for example. Pass holders still need park reservations if they want to visit a park before 2 p.m. and all day long on Saturdays and Sundays for Magic Kingdom. But, 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 
Disney tried to alleviate the blow of this news for APs by introducing a new system called Good To Go Days. A Good To Go Day is when a pass holder will not need a park pass reservation whatsoever if they want to visit the parks. The problem with these Good To Go Days is A, they're limited, and B, Disney doesn't give you a whole lot of heads up on when they're going to happen. Sometimes you may only know if a Good To Go Day is available weeks or even days in advance, meaning that APs just wind up booking Park Pass reservations anyway. Then if the day they booked a Park Pass reservation for just so happens to become a Good To Go Day, Disney will give their AP reservation back to use for a different trip instead. If you're trying to find the Good To Go calendar online, you'll need to search for the annual pass holder admission calendar on the Disney World website, and from there, select your annual pass type and the Disney park that you want to visit. After that, look for the green circles on the admission calendar. Found them? Great. Those are the aforementioned Good To Go days I was talking about. Note that, so far at least, it looks like the Good To Go days apply to all of the Disney World theme parks, not just one at a time, but this could change in the future, because Disney's all about switching things up on us sometimes. Now that we've got those Disney World problems off our chest, they don't have to become a weight on your shoulders. Remember, you can continue nipping those big Disney World problems in the bud by coming back here to hang with the DFB team. We're always out there in the parks every single day making our mistakes and letting you know about them so you don't make them too. And you can download that free Genie Plus cheat sheet I talked about earlier. That's going to come in really, really handy on all of your trips. You can get over on DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney Genie Plus. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.